We're looking at the question today of how Christians should understand and respond to culture. And with me today, I've got Adam Sabadosh from Hungary. And uh, Adam, you're well qualified to talk about this issue. You're a pastor, been leading an evangelical church in Hungary since 1999. You're a theologian. You've studied at Schloss Middersil and also uh, at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. And you're currently doing a PhD in New Testament yes. as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a leader. You helped set up the Hungarian Evangelical Forum and you're chairing its steering group. You are also a writer and a blogger. And, of course, you're a family man as well, married to Dora with, with uh, two boys. Perhaps we could start just with a very broad question and ask you, how would you actually define the word culture? Yes, I, when I, I talk about this issue, I try to not be too technical but to just come to this issue as people experience it. So when I, I talk about culture, I usually uh, explain that I'm, I'm talking about the beliefs, values, customs, and the organization of the society that surrounds followers of Jesus. So I, I usually talk about this issue from the perspective of followers of Jesus, who I try to help understand and and uh, interpret the culture that they live in and to find the, the best relationship with the culture. However, I, I sometimes uh, use culture in, in a more restricted sense. Um, um, Herman Dojewert, who, whose ideas I find very helpful, uh, talks about primitive cultures, and, uh, primitive societies and cultured societies, and it's a little bit um, in a, in a postmodern context, it's, it sounds uh, patronizing, but I think he does have a point uh, when he says that some societies learn to make distinctions between uh, or among various aspects of reality and study them in depth instead of just uh, drifting alongside the tradition without differentiation between the various aspects of life. So that's a more restricted sense of culture, which is also, I think, instinctive for many people. But normally what I mean is, is uh, the, the beliefs, values, uh, customs, and organization of the society that surrounds followers of Jesus. And why is it so important for Christians to, to understand and to respond to the culture that they're living in? But first of all, because Jesus did not ask the Father to take us out of the world, but to protect us from the evil one. So the plan of, of Jesus for us is that we would stay in the society that we found ourselves uh, called by God, but also to be protected from the evil one. So Jesus was aware of the fact that we have to stay at a place which is not necessarily friendly to us or to what we believe. And so we have a, we have a protective uh, purpose uh, when we engage with society. We have to be aware of the distinction and that we are not of the world, but we are in the world. Mm -hmm. But Jesus also said that we, we, we are the, the salt and the light of the world. So that means that we, we do have a, a transformative or a transformational purpose as well as a protective purpose when we engage with cultures. We, we have to know that Jesus wants us to have an impact on, on the society that surrounds us. But, but often, as, as uh, sometimes people say, it's the, it's the world that is the salt and the light of the church. And that happens often when we are unaware of the, the beliefs and the values of the society that, that surrounds us. And we are not discerning, so we are just uh, absorbing those beliefs and values we are without discernment. And when we engage with culture, I think we have the task of, of, uh, of interpreting it and to become discerning so that we can both protect ourselves and also influence the, the society with who we are and not the other way around, not let that the, it would happen the other way around. So we need to have a good understanding of the culture in which we live in order that we can be in the world but not of the world, to yes. be engaged in it but distinctive from it so that we can be 
salt and light in the world rather than it influencing yes. us. I think yeah. we, we need to have a good understanding of who we are. So we have to understand the revelation of God and the purpose of God for us at least as much as understand the culture around us. But I think we have to learn the culture so that we can be discerning, so that we can protect ourselves and also have an impact on the culture. Now, understanding culture has been a recurring challenge for Christians really throughout the whole of church history. Yes. Why, why is that? Well, uh, first, I, uh, the culture is constantly changing. So one generation is in a different culture than in the next generation. And it's, it's, it's faster and faster. The change is, is so rapid that it's really hard to keep up with the, with the changes. And it's not just cross-cultural, but within one single culture, generationally, it, it is new and newer, newer and newer cultures, uh, and also subcultures within those cultures. So it, that in itself makes it a difficult issue. But I think often the... It's a big challenge for us because we, our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ is flaky and weak. So we are more easily swayed by the culture than we, we should be. Because if our commitment to the Lord Jesus and his, if our loyalty to him would be stronger, I think we would have a, do a better job. Uh, but there are other issues as well. I, I think um, the... The, the protective uh, purpose often stifles all transformative uh, role that we could play in society. For example, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, under communism, we learned to protect ourselves from the, the larger majority culture. And when we finally had the opportunity to exert some um, influence on, on society, we, we, we just did not have that, that mindset if that we actually could make some change. But it, go, it could go the other way around. If, if a, a Christian um, uh, group in society experiences that they could actually transform society, that brings in very often an a absorbing of the culture, yes. which results in um, a lack of distinction between the gospel and the culture, which I think happened in, in Christendom. And it also, uh, another good example could be the, the North American Christian model, where so they, they were so successful at impacting the culture from a, a Christian pers uh, point of view that uh, unawares, some elements of that culture became almost part of the gospel. Like free, free market is almost like a, a sixth sola or a fifth a spiritual law or something. That yes. Yes. It's, it's part, and part of the gospel baggage yes. and there is no discernment. So, so, so we, can be over, we can be over protective, retiring into our little escapers get, ghettos. Yes to stop ourselves being influenced by the world, and yet we end up not being able to transform it. But on the other hand, we can get so much into the world and lack discernment about the way it's changing us and shaping yes. the gospel that we're That's preaching. Exactly. So we need to be yes. aware of those two yes. dangers. And, and also, I think often we just lack great thinkers who could help us do the intellectual task of, of discerning that so uh, that can be another issue why why this is such a big challenge that often we are just not helped by great thinkers so places like like the european leadership forum is is so helpful because it it really breeds thinkers who can help us do that intellectual task that is needed and, and, and the whole relation of christianity to culture is something that that some thinkers have engaged quite deeply in I wonder if you can talk us through some of the major Protestant paradigms mm -hmm. for relating to culture and, and the different models and their strengths and weaknesses. Yes. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating um, experience that when uh, Christians, and I, I'm speaking about Protestant evangelical Christians, when they, they come to this issue 
often they have very different assumptions or different models in, in their minds, and they are not often conscious of this model. Mm -hmm. And as I, I... They think it's the only way of thinking about it. Yes, yeah. yes. But, but I, I found that there are um, at least three, three Protestant models that, that live side by side, mm -hmm. coming from the three branches of the Reformation. Okay. The, the Anabaptists um, uh, had a, a dualistic understanding of the relationship between, between the Christian practice and faith and the, and the culture surrounding us. They, tr they, they thought as if they were two different circles which were not in touch with each other. So, At all. Yeah. so uh, Anabaptists would not let the state get involved in being baptism. That, I think that was the, the issue of baptism wasn't just whether it's a child or a, mm -hmm. an adult, but, but is it a function of the state or not? And they would clearly separate the two and they would not become state functionaries because whereas some other Protestant denominations had become yes. state functionaries and even with baptism and so and yes yeah, so that's the Anabaptist model which which is based on uh, on some scriptures like uh, um, uh, the love of the world is enmity with God or uh, I think it's very well expressed by Tertullian the uh, church father's uh, sentence what has Athens to do with Jerusalem yes yeah. But the Lutherans had a very different uh, model for, for culture and, and Christianity. Uh, Luther was a, a dialectical thinker. His mind was all constantly uh, shifting from one extreme to the other and somehow grasped reality as a, as a dynamic reality, a paradox of two things, like, like Simo used to set back at or simultaneously uh, justified and a sinner. And he... He, he spoke of the two kingdom idea, which became a, a basically the Lutheran approach to this subject, where the Christian, so it's, it's two circles, but they have an overlap, and the Christian man finds himself or herself in both circles, mm -hmm. but not necessarily at the same time. So you go to church on Sunday, and you are a Christian, you live in that Christian mindset yes. and and uh, and then the next day you go to your worldly environment which is run by different rules and you you work alongside those rules and uh, so this is a, a, a very interesting I find very interesting what what D, how Dietrich Bonhoeffer struggled with this Lutheran issue mm -hmm. when he was thinking whether to engage in a uh, a secular conspiracy which would involve lie but that that lying was an essential element of that duty which he found to be a, his, his own duty so he said sometimes I have to take on guilt so my conscience can be free mm -hmm. or clean which is a, this, this paradox of mm -hmm. the Lutheran model so you have an Anabaptist model where the two are entirely separate, a yes. Lutheran model where they're overlapping to some extent. Yes. And, and the third one? And the third one is, uh, comes from the, the Reformed branch. Calvin was a, a more systematic thinker, and he, one of the organizing principles of his theology and, and social thinking was the sovereignty of God, which really unites all of reality. So reality is not two spheres, it's, it's, it's one. All under God's authority. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like Abraham Kuyper said later that there is no one square inch in reality which Christ would not say this is this mine. Is mine. Yeah. So the, I, would, I, I think of this model as, as two circles, but the smaller circle is in the bigger circle. So it's, it, the, the Christians are like a paradigm for the whole of reality, and they are in the middle of rea reality, showing the world what what um, it's supposed to be. So when uh, Hans Rokmak, an uh, um, art historian, uh, spoke about Christianity, he said Jesus did not come to make us Christian, he, did, he came to make us human. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a very good uh, way of expressing the essence of the, the reformed understanding of, of Christianity and culture. So I, I, these, these are not clean models existing today. I think there are all kinds of mixtures of these, but I think you can still see the, the three. It's a, it's a very models. helpful way to think about it. I guess the question we're asking then as evangelicals is, is uh, how do those models measure up with scripture and what clues does the Bible give us about how to relate to, to yes. culture? Now, I think there are elements of truth in, in all three models. I personally find the, the reform model the, the closest in some way to the biblical paradigm because um, when I, I uh, Christopher Wright wrote some very helpful books on, uh, on Old Testament ethics and biblical theology. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one, of the, the, uh, one of the drawings that, that uh, you can find in many of his books is the triangle. Uh, the, the, the people, the law, and the land. Exactly, or, yeah. yes. So we should not think of our relationship with God as an independent, um, isolated experience from our earthly reality. God has always imagined our existence as a triangle. So we, we live in community with other beings on the earth under God. Yes. And that's what the fall corrupted. When uh, our relationship with God broke, then the, the earth was cursed. So our relationship with the earth was also, uh, it became problematic. And it's a broken reality. And in the scriptures, God is, is in the process of restoring that by, by, by um, uh, choosing a people, giving them a land, and making, a, making it a light for the world, a, a nation of priests for the nations and then it was extended to the nations when Christ came and we live as a as a diaspora in small koinonias fellowships of, of Christians who are paradigms for how how humanity is supposed to exist and and the and the ultimate goal is to uh, recreate the earth to renew renew the earth and um, and, and to populate it with the redeemed people of God. So it's, we, are, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth, yes. not just a new heaven. Yes. I think that's, that's one biblical so, so, paradigm. So as in the Old Testament, we had God as sovereign over the Jewish people, the Torah, the Jewish law, and the land of Israel. But we look forward as believers to the new heaven and the new earth where we are all Yes. Priests, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. And, and that's, that's the original purpose. When God called Abraham, uh, his covenant with Abraham already included the prospect that ultimately, through his seed, all the nations, all the nations will, will bless blessed. themselves. Yes, yeah. that's right. And, um, and I, th I find another helpful paradigm, which is also very well known, uh, the timeline, the... Uh, the already and the not yet. Yes, the which, tension between the already and the not yet. Yes, yeah. so the kingdom of God has come near, but we are still praying that the kingdom of God would come and be consummated, and we live in, in between the two times. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, I find this very helpful because it saves us from uh, an, an unwarranted optimism, mm -hmm. which always leads to disillusionment, because yes. behind every disillusionment there is an illusion, and we should not have the illusion that we can create a Christian society. Yes. In, uh, but we do have an, an over-realized eschatology, yes. they might say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it also saves us from, from a, an, an overly pessimistic view where we do not anticipate the manifestation of the kingdom of God and yeah. its power and, and its presence. In, in our midst. So we, we are the salt and the light of the world, but we are not going to turn this, this earth into paradise before Christ comes back. Yes, yes. Well, tell us a bit about what Christian philosophical contributions have been to this, uh, yeah. to this whole concept of, of Christ and culture. Yeah, I, I think uh, I mentioned the, the importance of great thinkers. Um, the Christian Christian Church has always had um, 
great thinkers who helped us think through the, the issues that the time we live in raises for us in our relationship with culture. So in the second century, the apologists helped us think through what it means to live in a Hellenistic world and uh, those philosophies and gods and ideas, uh, what we should do about them. So how to relate to Greek culture. Yes. Um, yeah. Or um, when, f when Rome fell, uh, Augustine helped us think through what, what was going on and whether the accusations against Christians were were that warranted or not, it was, uh, he tried to think through the, the issues of, of that traumatic experience of, of uh, Europe and North Africa. Uh, and um, we, had, we had great thinkers in the recent past, in the 20th century, like uh, Adolf Schlatter or C.S. Lewis or Francis Schaeffer and others who try to make sense of what, what is going on, on around us. And I, I particularly find, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that <coughs> I find uh, Hermann Dojewerd uh, extremely relevant. I, I was surprised how deeply he thought about some of the issues that we encounter in, um, in our reality. Just to give you an example, uh, he, he, he talks about the fact that um, uh, that there are always uh, ground motives that determine how we interpret and experience the various aspects of life, the, from the, the numerical, the biological, the relational, the logical, the uh, economical, the uh, ethical, and, and so on. And uh, one of the things that he emphasizes is that here in the West, we see four ground motives or four um, sets of grand motives uh, fighting for dominance. Uh, one is the Greek ground motive of uh, form and matter. So the Greeks had this tension of, on the one hand, the form, on the other hand, the matter. So the very rough um, uh, physical pleasure to the fullness and the longing for the ideal forms, the, the platonic ideals, and, and something that is, is above us that somehow unites all the, the, uh, uh, the multifaceted aspects of reality. So there was that tension, which is still in our culture. But then came the biblical... So where would you identify it in our culture at the moment, that kind of thinking? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you can... Uh, you can see the, um, the, uh, the, the search for pleasure and, uh, and the, uh, the celebration of our physical uh, nature, uh, even in rebellion against uh, some of the Christian and other forms of I idealism that... Uh, like I think Freudian uh, psychoanalysis is, is, can be one form of this that, that says that we have this um, idealization of our desires, but there is the, the raw desire down here, and there is a tension there. But uh, this, is, uh, this was challenged by the biblical um, ground motives, which is the the creation, the fall, and the yes. uh, redemption uh, process, which then, and th this is where Doevert becomes very interesting to me, there was a synthesis made between the two, the Greco-Roman and the biblical, in scholasticism, which basically uh, mixed creation and nature, uh, creation and, f and matter, and uh, mixed redemption and uh, and the form and it and called it grace so it it created the nature grace uh, dichotomy as a third grand motive which is not exactly the biblical one which is uh, creation fall and redemption and not exactly the Greek one which is matter and form so it's a third uh, grand motive 
And then the latecomer in our Western culture was humanism, mm. which just took grace out and put freedom instead mm. in the place of uh, mm. grace. And, and Doyevert says that what we are experiencing right now is that this fourth set of grand motives became the dominant one. Mm. And he says the European, uh, European culture uh, is fragile and there is a battle going on between these grand motives. But the only, only way there is some kind of balance is that one of them is always the leading grand motive. Yes. Yeah. And currently it's the humanistic one. Yeah. But we can see how, uh, how this tension uh, characterizes our, the dominant grand motive in our European societies. That on the one hand, we are aware of our um, our natural biological realities and even physical and chemical reality, which many many Western people think determines our existence, uh, and there is a total determinism, deterministic naturalism on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a, a, a longing, an extreme longing for freedom, mm. to the degree that we can even completely deny biological reality, even think that we can choose our own uh, sex or gender or, and, and the biological nature that we have is, can be discarded and just not taken into account. So, so we, have this, we have this tension. That's an example of how a Christian thinker is, is trying to make sense of, of the reality that surrounds us and to challenge it. So yes. And I think, I think a, a lot of people listening to this will, will relate to living in uh, a European or perhaps an American culture where secular humanism is really the dominant worldview. Yes. And we're increasingly seeing people who are coming with that worldview occupying the positions of power in our society, whether it's mm -hmm. politics or art, media, entertainment, yes. business, uh, law, uh, the universities, all these mountains of our culture, if you like, are increasingly dominated by people who have yes. this kind of perspective. But that's very interesting that the warring cultures, the four different worldviews, then I suppose you can throw Islam into that yes. mix as well. Yes. And, and we've got this situation of constant change, haven't we? So, yes. so how, do, how are we as evangelical Christians to relate uh, to a society where culture is constantly changing. I, yes. I think just in my own lifetime, the dramatic mm -hmm. cultural changes that yes. uh, we've observed and which are still happening. So how do we mm -hmm. uh, operate in that society where change is so rapid? Yes, I, it's interesting you mentioned Islam because I find this a very interesting tension that it brings into this uh, correlation and, and how it will affect the, the balance that we have had. And uh, I think there are some aspects that Islam brings in that challenges our Western world in, a, in an interesting and, and maybe even helpful way. And there are some other challenges that it brings that is, is really scary. Uh, I think... And I guess it's not just Muslims who have, might be first or second or third generation living already in European cities, but the yeah. great waves of immigration that we're now seeing yes. as a result of what's happening in the yes. Middle East. So there's going to be more change ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm anticipating a lot of change coming into, into our Western world. So how do we relate to this ever-changing culture Yes, Christian believers? Well, I, I find the most important thing right now is that we should study the Bible and to be rooted in who we are, to understand it, to, and, and even celebrate it, and to be very bold and open about the perspective that we talk about the world from. Because we have a, a healthy and robust uh, worldview, and, and we, we have a reason to celebrate, and often the, our position has been challenged and attacked and criticized and mocked, and we kind of accepted that position and we became defensive. So we, we are constantly trying to give arguments why, why we are not what we are labeled with.
but I think we can be much more positive and much more um, 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 bold about why we think the world is healthier, why we think the world is better if we live it the way that uh, we think is the, is the proper design for, for life. And, and um, so to, I think it's important that we just celebrate the worldview that we have mm. and the, how much it makes sense, creation for redemption. Uh, it's, it just makes sense. It, it make, whereas many other worldviews just don't make sense. So I think that's, that's an important thing. It's got great explanatory power in terms yes. of understanding what we see. Yes. So you're talking both about the, the weaknesses in the mm -hmm. Christian response to, to European culture, but also how we could be stronger. So let's yeah. just think first about the weaknesses. Where do you think Christians have made mistakes in their response to culture mm -hmm. that we need to identify and rectify? Yes. I, I think... Uh, uh, defeatism and uh, and a kind of pietism has not been helpful in in our engagement with culture, and I'm I'm seeing this with a high respect for the pietists. My my uh, my grandmother and my mother are great examples to me. They come from a pietistic background, and I admire ad, I, and I admire the example and the faith that they. Uh, showed and demonstrated. So I'm not talking about pietism. I have a high respect for the pietist movement. I'm talking about the the attitude of uh, not expecting too much change from society. Uh, An over pessimistic yes, view yes. To, to the extent that yes. Christians are able to transform and yes. change culture. So I think we we, we must. We must uh, believe that the, the kingdom of God is still exercising, or it, it's still changing reality around us. And, and the gospel is the power of God. We, the Holy Spirit is with us, so we should not accept the defeatist position. However, uh, I think the second weakness is that when, second weakness is when we uh, try to make the change uh, from top bottom instead of bottom bottom up. Yes. So we we think that uh, if we have the right people in in, lead, in leadership uh, in society in politics, I'm not denying the importance of those people. But uh, when we uh, when we think that we can change society from t top down, I think we are doomed to failure because. The trends and the human heart and the rebellion of the human heart and in masses, rebellion of the human heart in masses, mm. which the Bible calls the world, mm. is a powerful phenomenon. And we can't change that from, from a top-down approach. So I think we, that's a weakness when we, when we try to do it that way. Uh, instead of instead of just uh, following our calling wherever we are. So if someone is, has a political calling, that's great. We should stand behind those people. But we should not hope too much from that in itself. We, we, we need to do the job of, of, um, of, of spreading the gospel, living out the gospel, and, and just be credible joyful, faithful witnesses to the reality that we celebrate. And, and so I, I see that as a and weakness. And then the change will naturally happen as yes. believing Christians get into positions of influence where they can yes. start to shape what's around them. Yes. Yeah. But it starts with the heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes another weakness is when Christians um, are engaged with culture without strong biblical convictions. Mm -hmm. Or when they have strong biblical convictions without engaging with the culture. So both is, is a, a current weakness in, in the church. We, I see people who have strong biblical convictions, but there is no bridge that would help the people see how, how that re relates to the reality that they live in. Whereas others get engaged with the culture and then just disappear in the culture because they don't have strong biblical convictions. 
So we must be aware of being over pessimistic and not expecting yes. enough. We, we, we must see that it's not a top down approach, yes. but bottom up or saturating all levels of, of culture. Yes. And we need to have strong biblical convictions and be engaged yes. with the world. So I guess the question now is, is what's needed now to help Christians better understand and respond to culture? What, what do we need to be a more culturally engaged church, yeah. a church which is going to be more effective in transforming the world around us? I come to the European Leadership Forum. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Yes. Um, no, seriously, I think this is a great, great initiative because there is so much thinking going on here in the presence of the Lord. So it's not, it's not a detached thinking, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a, a thinking process. So I, ha I have appreciated very much that year after year, relevant issues came up and were discussed by people who had studied it, who had an insight on it, and that was very, very helpful. So that, that's something I would, I would certainly recommend for people who, who want to um, get involved in this. But also, I think often just uh, to find a few people who have done the work of studying culture and just follow their thoughts. Uh, there are great thinkers, um, and and some of those are available online now. So Would you like to great... recommend some of the people you think are really at the cutting edge in this area? Yeah, I, well, it's culture is so so diverse that, that it, you I need could, a uh, different yeah, commentator so, for every culture. Yeah, so but, you can find... But, but it, perhaps a few European cultures? Like I, I th for example, just uh, from the top of my head, I think uh, Andrew Fellows, mm -hmm. how he, from a lot of conversations mm -hmm. with, with the children of the culture, uh, just thought through the issues, the questions, and came up with some answers. Or um, I've just read... it was at Libri in the UK, and it's yes. now at Christian Heritage in yes. Cambridge. Yeah. Or uh, I've just read uh, Greg Richard's uh, Bird's Eye View on, uh, on Europe, or I, I can't remember the title exactly, but it was a great analysis from a, uh, a, a big picture analysis of what is going on in, in Europe, mm -hmm. and what has been going on, and what are the challenges, and and that, that just gives a good foundation for a lot of uh, more specific strategies. Yeah. Or I found Oz Guinness's books um, very helpful in the past. Craig Gay's um, um, analysis of secularism I found very helpful in the past. And I, I could probably go on. So there are many, many good authors and speakers. And Focal Online is a great resource. Um, Center where yes, you can that's find the form so of Christian many leaders online yes. and the resources from past uh, yes. forums like this one. For example, I, I found the scientific part extremely helpful. Mm. The the mat materials that you can find from Paul Nelson, Stephen Meyer, and others that address um, the issues of the tree of life, how it's the idea cha is changing in the scientific world, and it just some of those lecturers go to the f the roots of the issues. That's another thing I would I would I would say that it's important that we don't just react to phenomena, but to go to the root of of the issues. So where is that turning point? Where is that philosophical assumption? Where is that uh, historical uh, shift where 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 that can be explained? What what we see around us? And so in, in science, I find very good materials on uh, Folklore Online that explain some of that. And, but the, the advantage of the, of the age that we live in is that so, ma so many things are accessible, have become accessible all over the world. So you can, and I think that's our responsibility to make accessible good responses, good materials. And, uh, so, so people would see that we thought through about those issues, we have answers, and we celebrate our answers. Mm. And now, not everyone will get an opportunity to come to the forum or perhaps even be involved yes. in, the, in the networks that are happening around Europe. So what about for your average pastor, pastoring his, 
his flock uh, in Europe today, how would you point them to really taking this whole cultural mandate forward? Yes. Well, we, 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 uh, I would not um, gi give up on involving them to all kinds of things or events where, where they can have access to material. So one of, this is one of the reasons why we started the Hungarian Evangelical Forum. Yes where we invite Hungarian pastors who don't speak English or don't have to speak English and, uh, and bring in good speakers and make good resources available so that they can also hear and learn about those things. I think publishing books is a hugely important uh, thing and it's, it's going on and I'm very thankful that, that good, good books have been translated into our language uh, I think blogging, I, I try to, and I'm not the only one, uh, try to write shorter articles on certain issues that m those pastors and other Christians would, would read and find answers to some of the, the challenging issues that they, they face. So I think there are various, various ways of of um, making resources available. Yes. So there's a huge amount happening that people can get engaged yes. in. Yes. Adam, thank you very much for your time today and helping us to understand how we can get to grips with culture and respond to it. And just that last, as a last yes. sentence, I would right. like to say that I think it's very important that we would not forget, that we should not forget that God is on his throne and whatever changes happen around us, and we see some really uh, huge cataclysmic changes in, in the West, these will not shake God's throne. So we should be very hopeful and just rejoice over this fact, because there have been bad times in, in the past. If bad times come, we will survive, but we should stick to the Lord Jesus. His head is above the waters, even if our body is under the water. And so that's, that's something I would, I would also just uh, remind ourselves of. And it's a great note to finish on, to remind ourselves that Jesus is building his church, that the gates of hell will not prevail yes. against it, and that we are coming to the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess yes. uh, in Europe and everywhere else yes. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Adam, for your time. Thank you.